Oh, that was wonderful to have some live music again. Thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Reverend Alice, and I'm so happy to be with you here this morning on this Mother's Day. And so I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day in whatever mother that you might be celebrating. It might be your birth mother. It might be Mother Earth. You might even, if, you're, if you did happen to go through that process of giving birth, perhaps celebrating yourself. For this is a day that we, we honor all creation in whatever form. And we call it Mother's Day, so welcome everyone. So we are in May here, and this is the second Sunday that we're working with this monthly theme, the Holy, Holy Uprising. And we're talking about this, this uprising that not and I know we first think about an uprising as something that's happening out there. And of course, in the last 16 months, we've seen a lot of that demonstrated in the world. But we're talking about that holy, with a W, H-O-L-L-Y, holy, H-O-L-Y, uprising. And it is an uprising that starts and comes from within and then gets expressed. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something we're calling revolutionary love. I've been thinking about love and social justice, and I've also been thinking about what love really is. I've been thinking about what I call egoic love versus authentic love. And you'll often hear me talk about love because it's my purpose My purpose is to reveal love. And so when I am in the world and the world does what the world does, I often, uh, when I gather myself up and I'm in the middle of an experience, I will lean on love as that vehicle or that mechanism that will help me make sense of things, that will help me get clearer, will help me guide my actions, and, and hopefully, if I'm really awake and aware, will help me choose my words. But one of the things that I think happens with love is it gets kind of a bad rap because it gets overused, it gets um, diluted. We, We love each other, we love our children, we love our family, we love our partners, we love our center, we love pizza, right? And so we dilute love because we get it confused with preferences likes and dislikes. We like something or we dislike something and we call it love or we call it the absence of love. And we end up dropping into that dualistic relationship with something that is completely unitive, that has no other side. Love exists wholly in and of itself. And when we approach love from a dualistic place, well, we're probably dabbling in that that preference area as opposed to really working with authentic love. My personal definition for egoic love is where we use love because there's something we want or there's something we expect or there's some kind of exchange that we're looking for. And what I know about authentic love is that there is no other side. It simply expresses itself in its wholeness and it fills the space so that there's only love. Authentic love is healing, it's revealing, it's powerful because it's unconditioned. There are no conditions to authentic love. It simply is a power in and of itself. And according to David Hawkins, who wrote a couple of really fabulous books you might be familiar with, Uh, Power Versus Force, or his sequel, Letting Go, The Path to Surrender, he says that less than 1% of the population actually loves unconditionally. Gosh, that's a pretty harsh statistic, don't you think? Like, really? Who? What? How does he know that? What what possible metric could he be using to know that only 1% of the population loves unconditionally? 
like to think that there's a lot of uh, space in between that, what I'm calling the egoic love and authentic love, that we often find ourselves in this continuum moving towards the middle or towards one end or the other, and that it's, it's a process. It's a process of awakening. It's a process of being present. It's a pro- process of being conscious. And I'd venture to say that when I'm having an experience where I'm feeling an absence of love, well, then I've dropped into that place of preferences again. And I have this opportunity to relocate myself, to notice that continuum of egoic love versus authentic love, and to relocate myself in a place that is, that is more powerful, that is more life-affirming. Sometimes it's easy, and sometimes not so much. (laughs) And when I think about how egoic love typically is looking for some kind of an exchange, some tit for tat, some, some, if I do this, I'm expecting you to do that, and, and authentic love really is this place that we can inhabit that says, how can I serve you through love? with no expectations, with, with, with not needing anything in return, that I am just in this service to this powerful life force, this creation that wants to move through me so that we can remember our oneness. Well, then I think David Hawkins' metric of 1% might not be too far off as we live in this world of condition and we live in the, the ups and the downs and everything that's going on in our world, I, I, I think it can be kind of tough to inhabit that place of authentic love, but not impossible. Not impossible. I think, I think maybe we're all in the 1% at one point or another. At one point or another. So maybe if we wait that, wait, I'm getting too much in the math and my accounting, I'm... <laughs> But maybe if we were to weight that percentage, it would be much higher. So now that we have looked at um, egoic love versus authentic love, and we're a little clearer about this overused word that really does have a lot of power underneath it, what does it have to do with social justice? And how does it square? Our book of the month is an amazing piece of literature. I'm going to say it's a must read. It was published last year. The author is Valerie Kerr, and the title is See No Strangers. And Valerie is a brown woman who is a seasoned civil, uh, seasoned civil rights activist and a lawyer. But first and foremost, she is a Sikh. And if you're not familiar with Sikhism, it is a practice of devotion and remembrance of God in every moment in every day. And Sikhs endeavor to practice truthfulness. They endeavor to see equality in all of humanity. And they absolutely turn away from superstitions or any kind of blind ritual that doesn't have true meaning and depth underneath it. It's a powerful practice. And Dare I say, there's a lot of common threads in many of the other spiritual paths that we talk about here at Centers for Spiritual Living. And in Valerie's book, and in her TED Talk, which I highly recommend, and in her organization entitled The Revolutionary Love Project, Valerie talks about her values for social justice and how she has come to understand that the way to social justice is this thing called revolutionary love. And unlike David Hawkins, whose powerful book really looks at this vibration of love and as some kind of hierarchical relationship to enlightenment that we get to once we surrender to our lower nature and can then raise our vibration up, Valerie talks about love as this presence and this power that is both that fire in the belly when we're face up against something in the world that is completely unacceptable, and also that powerful love that understands how 
when we can really inhabit love, that it truly does dissolve everything unlike it. So that we can really know no sense of otherness. Valerie tells the story of her uncle who was murdered shortly after 9-11 just because he donned a turban by a racist. It's part of what motivated her and propelled her forward as a civil rights activist and to the, all the work that she's done over the last 20 years. And she goes on to tell this story in her TED Talk and in her book about 15 years later when she and her uncle, who was the brother of her uncle that was murdered, get together, and she and Rana decide to call the man that murdered her uncle, who's in prison serving time for his crime. And she talks about how they got on the phone with Frank, and they wanted to ask him why. Why? Did you murder our beloved? And Frank answered, I'm sorry for what happened, but I'm also sorry for all the people that died in 9-11. And you probably hear the same thing that Valerie heard in that response, in that he wasn't taking responsibility for his action, that he was still trying to make some kind of excuse that there, was, might, there might have been some reason for this senseless crime. And Valerie shares how she was absolutely incensed, that she could feel the anger building up in her. And she wanted to protect her beloved Uncle Rana from this man who clearly didn't understand what he had done. And much to her surprise, her uncle asked the question, said this, the following statement to Frank, he said, Frank, this is the first time I'm hearing you say you feel sorry. And Frank responded, Yes, I am sorry for what I did to your brother. One day when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother, and I will hug him, and I will ask him for forgiveness. To which Rana replied, We have already forgiven you, brother. And there it is. Rana and Frank found true freedom. They found freedom through forgiveness. And forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not the absence of consequence or accountability, but real forgiveness when we enter it, when we lean into it, when we begin to allow the power of it to move through us, truly frees us. It frees us from hatred. And when we are free from hatred, we can see more clearly, we can see how racism is born from ignorance and wounding and fear and breeds violence and unacceptable behavior. We don't excuse it. We don't, we don't try to make space for it. But we seek freedom from it so that it no longer rules us. Hatred dislocates us on that continuum between o o or, um, o egoic love and authentic love. And forgiveness can help us to begin to relocate ourselves to a place of true power. In her book, Valerie talks about the three kinds of love that we need to work with together. She says we, we need to love ourselves, but we can't only love ourselves because if we only love ourselves, we might suffer from escapism or worse yet, narcissism. And that we, we need to love others, but it's ineffective if we aren't loving ourselves as well. And she also says we need to love what she calls our opponents. But if we only love our opponents, well then we dishonor. We dishonor our own needs. We dishonor the needs of others. So Valerie talks about the need to do all three of these things. And then when we can combine the love of ourselves and the love of others and the love of our opponents, when we can combine those th three things, well, then we can drop into revolutionary love. 
seeing no stranger is simply recognizing that there's a part of me that I don't know yet. And I think that when we look at this idea of our beautiful vision of a world that works for everyone, when I reflect on that, when I begin to, to hold that highest vision and then I look out into the world and I see separatism and I see hatred and I see racism and I see discontent and discord, I have to ask myself, how can I even espouse such a high hope as a world that works for everyone? But I have to tell you that this is more than fancy words, some kind of fantasy that we speak on a Sunday morning or pretty words to make us feel better. It is that aspiration that pulls us and draws us forward so that we can first go within, that we can tap into that revolutionary love and that we can use that evolutionary love as an, something that rises up from within us so that it then informs who we are in the world. It, not, not necessarily what we do, because I think that has to come second. I think what has to come first is knowing who we are. And, and we do that by tapping into revolutionary love. Reverend Masando Hiroka of Mile High Church writes, Revolution is when great changes in paradigms happen at a collective level. And while the collective consciousness is always changing, revolutions and these leaps in our collective consciousness are rare and sacred times in which we are all changing rapidly. Revolutionary love is bringing collective change and collective consciousness together. Through our love for one another, we are boldly asked to act not only on behalf of ourselves and of those we love, but even those we have not yet learned how to love. So Reverend Masado is saying the same thing that Valerie is saying, but he's saying it in our, in our science of mind speak and the way we uh, use this philosophy to walk out our life. And I think this revolutionary love is really a, a deep and powerful call to action. And I find myself really reflecting on my own behavior, my own words, my own actions. I recently found myself in a situation where we had an individual who was, who was trying to share the power of prayer in his own life. And so he was telling us a story. And in the story, he began to digress. And he began to make racist comments. And he clearly didn't know that they were racist comments because he kept repeating them. And I have to tell you, I handled it badly. <laughs> I really did. I tripped all over myself in trying to love myself and love the others in the room and love the transgressor. I, I, I was very unskilled in how I moved through that. But I want to, and so I, I share that with you to say that if you are willing to make this commitment to revolutionary love, if you're willing to uh, stand up for love in every situation, it's going to take some skill building. It's going to take some building of muscle. And I promise, if you are willing to lean in, you too will make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> You too will screw up. <laughs> but if, we're, if we can endeavor as a community to hold each other in this safe container of authentic love, well, you'll have the same experience I had, where the other members of that community held me in a loving way so that I could humbly begin to see the places where I needed to build skills. This world that we are creating, this world that works for everyone, we're going to have to, I'll, we're going to have to fail a couple of times. We're going to have to make a couple of mistakes. But I will tell you, as my beloved David will tell you, that's not a failure. It's simply an opportunity to make another choice. It's an opportunity to move in a different direction. It's an opportunity to live from our authenticity. 
And there is an opportunity coming up that I want to share with you. I don't usually make announcements in the, in the tail end of my talk, but Mohini, if we can change the slide, please. There's a, a group in Santa Cruz called Showing Up for Racial Justice, Surge, and they're doing a virtual online workshop called Calling People In, Not Out, Strategies to Respond and Initiate Conversations About Race and Racism. And we've had a couple of our members who have taken this. And um, it's on Saturday, May 15th at 11 a.m. And really to benefit from this, you, you can't watch the recording because there's some role playing that you'll be able to do in breakout rooms so that you can really practice the skills you're learning. Um, Surge has done this a couple of times. If this date doesn't work for you, check them out. Do what I did. I signed up for their e-news and I was able to catch this workshop. So I hope that you'll join me. I know I'll be there this Saturday. Um, and if this isn't the right time for you, I hope that you'll find those ways that you can begin to build your skills as a revolutionary lover. And we can change the slide back again. Despite the evidence that we see around us where things seem to be kind of falling apart, things are not working, everybody's trying to make their way through, through what's going on in the world right now, I really do believe that we can create a world that works for everyone. And I think it, in our movement, in our philosophy, I've said this before and I'm going to keep saying it, we've done an excellent job of helping people and empowering them to create a world that works for us individually but that the next evolutionary leap that Masando was talking about is that leap where we take what we've learned and we allow it to rise up from within so that we can begin to learn how to create that world that works for everyone. It might be tempting to want to check out or go to sleep because it's not easy. It requires change. It requires being awake, it requires reflection, it requires skill building, it requires meditation. But all these things so enrich our lives. They bring us together, they bring us to that place where we can remember our oneness. And so I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that you too want to be what I call an evolutionary <laughs> and to step into revolutionary love, to begin to learn how to practice this so that we can, as our centering statement says, respond to life with love. And the more work that you do on your own evolutionary path to have whatever rises up within you, you might be, you might be ending that statement with responding to life with joy or responding to life with creativity. You'll know because it'll be your authentic expression of how revolutionary love wants to show up as you. So let's take that into prayer, shall we? I invite you to lower your gaze or close your eyes, to take a deep breath and to feel the, the strength and the sturdiness of the chair or the floor beneath you, to know that there is a power and a presence that is moving in as and through each one, that this is the divine love that is forever giving itself to the world by means of you. And so you cannot be unaffected that when this love, this givingness of spirit moves in and through you, that it changes you too. That it allows each one of us to tap into that authentic love so that we can allow it to raise and rise up from within us so that we can absolutely be practitioners of revolutionary love. And so I know for each one that we are brave, we are courageous, <laughs> creative and cre courageous. We are courageous. <laughs> We are courageous! <laughs> and we walk it out. We allow ourselves to, to make it up as we go along, to trust that Spirit is guiding every step. We don't necessarily need to know the whole way. But 
what I know for each one of us is that when we commit to love, when we commit to that place of really wanting to have a world that works for everyone, where revolutionary love lifts each one of us up, where forgiveness comes in and transmutes any experience so that we are all finally free, I know for each one that we are not only the carriers or the vehicles or the container for this love, for we are revolutionary love ourselves. And so it is with a gladdened heart that I speak this word, that I know this highest truth for each one, and I trust, I trust that as we walk out this day, this week, this month, this year, as we continue to walk into whatever this new normal is going to look like, it is the revolutionary love that carries us forward with power, with potency, and to freedom. And I simply release this word. We anchor it in all of that and so much more by saying together, and so it is. Thank you.